Very good, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. For those of you who are online, we have had a prayer. You just couldn't hear it. Sorry about that. But know that you were prayed for also. We got people in in uh, Spokane and people in Atlanta and people here and, and scattered all over, and we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Someone just, our Belinda just asked me what we're going to do when we finish Revelation. She's optimistic that we will. <laughs> and uh, I told her I'd been thinking about it, and uh, what I've been thinking about is uh, since we've been here at, on this campus, beginning in the what's now our children's location, children's classroom area, uh, I will have taught through all of the New Testament except for the little books between Hebrews and Revelation. So I'm thinking that I'll probably jump back into James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude. And it really is probably working out pretty well because Rick is beginning his series today on the book of James. And by the time I get through with Revelation, He'll probably be, be about finished with that, and it'll be time for me to come back and correct all of the mess <laughs> that he's made of it. So it was probably a, a, a God thing that, that we'll be switching into James. And if I want him to know that, I'll tell him. So we are in the 18th chapter, and the... Uh, the tone and tenor of Revelation is, is beginning, and it's in the beginning stage, of making some uh, fairly significant changes because uh, we're getting uh, into a new phase. We're still involved in the carrying out of the opening of the seven seals, the blowing of the seventh, the seventh, the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh bowl of God's wrath. We're still talking about the rise and fall of nations and false doctrines and institutions. We're still talking about the coming fall of Rome for John's people. But we're beginning to get more eschatological language. And particularly when we get into the 19th chapter, we're going to see the tone really begin to change as we start seeing the, the wedding feast being prepared. So we're looking at end of time issues more and more. We'll get into the, the final battle of Armageddon, the time when the tipping point will have been reached. And this experiment of, that began in the garden will will transition to something entirely different. So we have that to look forward to. So we are in the 18th chapter of Revelation. And we listened to the reading of it uh, last week, so we're going to jump right into the, the text. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven with great authority. The earth was flooded with the light of his glory. It's amazing, isn't it? One little angel <laughs> engulfing the world, the earth, in bright light. We talked some a week or two ago about the mystery title of Babylon, Mystery Babylon. Well, the mystery has now been revealed, and we're seeing the shedding of the light on what's coming, and what's coming for this world and for those who stand opposed to the lamb is doom. He shouted out in a strong voice, and this is what he said, Babylon the great has fallen. She has fallen. She has become a place for demons to live, a refuge for every unclean spirit, a refuge for every unclean bird, a refuge for every unclean, hateful beast. All of this is being spoken by the angel in the past tense. And yet for John's hearers, he's talking prophetically, isn't it? Hasn't yet happened. But 
in declaring this, the outcome is so certain that he speaks of future events as though they had already happened. The language here is uh, from Isaiah chapters 13 and 34 and from Jeremiah chapters 1 and, and 51. All this talk about Babylon, we're, we're saying that we're reasonably certain to a high degree of certainty that when he talks about Babylon, the people who listened to him or who heard the reading of these scrolls would have immediately heard Rome. Well, why didn't he just say Rome? Then we wouldn't have to guess about it. Well, I, I don't know. Of course, he's using symbolic language, number one. It's apocryphal language. And we say that the book of Revelation is not a code book to inform us when to expect the end of the world. But it's possible that there, it is a code book in another respect. Um, and I don't know that this is the case, but many theologians think so. That the reason that he would use apocryphal literature, the reason that he would refer to Rome as Babylon, is because if these scrolls, if these manuscripts, as they're copied and distributed and read, were to fall into the hands of the Roman government, and they're reading all this language about Rome, not so good for the Christians, right? But in all probability, that they can read Babylon and not have a clue what's going on. So there's a possibility, at least, that, that the language is indeed a code that Christians would immediately recognize and understand, but that would, to some degree at least, protect them from the fallout of the Roman Empire if it were to fall into their hands. Rome has certainly become a dwelling place of demons. It was corrupt. Uh, when you look at people like Nero and Domitian and Caligula and, and, and the lives that they lived and the, and the way that they treated people and the way that they treated the citizens and the enemies of Rome. I mean, it was, it was ugly. And we're, we're talking about reaching tipping points here. Just coincidentally... You know, I, I know that when we talk about the Muslim world, we, we usually ha use it as a, a, a byword, as an as a ugly thing. And, and certainly there's much to be um, not liked about the Koran and about the whole Muslim movement. But if you think about having grown up in that environment, with the strictness that they apply to obedience to the Koran and to the moral and civil laws that they have imposed. And then you have them planted here in America and they look at our culture. Can you see how corrupt and immoral and repugnant the United States would look to, it does look, to people who have that high degree of determination and consecration and dedication to a very high moral standard. We can see whatever we want to about the rest of it. I'm not arguing in favor of all of us becoming Muslims. <laughs> but I'm just saying that uh, when they turn on their TV uh, or go to the internet and they see people like Cardi B and listen to her and, and others like her. And they, they, every, every movie on our, on our televisions, uh, if it's not G, you know, uh, it's not good. Um, how, do we, how do we know if, a, if, a leaders, if our leaders are lying? Now their lips are moving, you know. Yeah. And, and just imagine if you had grown up in a culture like the Muslims do, and I know there are exceptions, I'm talking generalities, and you, you put them in our culture, 
it's just, it, 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 you know, um, there, there's this story you've all heard about the, the, the frog in the water and on the stove, and you heat the water slow enough, and the frog won't jump out until it boils. Anyway, I don't know if that's true or not, but the principle makes sense. You, you become gradually acclimatized. It just, it just you, we have reached where we are today, not overnight, but over generations. And we've just become accepting of it. And it's pretty frightening. There's another saying that says, lay down with dogs and get up with fleas. You heard that? Anyway. What is carbon heat? Oh, uh, it's, it's <laughs> you poor innocent thing. Uh, don't go look her up. It's, it's a performer. Okay. Don't go look her up. Okay. Now you will. I know I shouldn't have ever put her name up there. <laughs> She's representative of the worst of the performers as far as vulgarity and absolute profanity. It's just she's, she's, as they say, is on steroids. Okay. Hang on a second. I don't. Uh, for the first, I told them I didn't have to have my. Somebody stole our stand. And I told him I didn't have to have her because nobody was making comments. So now everybody wants to make a comment. I had a couple, of, I had an experience a couple of weekends ago with a Muslim doctor and uh, his wife. And he's married to a woman from New Orleans, Catholic. And I asked him about their relationship. And they just looked at each other and could not explain it. So I think things are changing for them also living here. Well, I, I, I think, you know, if you put them into our culture, it'll, it'll it, it, again, if you lay down with dogs, you get up with fleas. And, you know, you, you become acclimatized, acclimatized to the culture in which you are absorbed. And I, I think that, you know, individually, that probably could be the case. Yeah. Yeah. Either one. So, verse 3, all the nations drank from the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth committed fornication with her, and the traders of the earth became rich from the power of her luxury. Rome is using nations, kings, and merchants to bring about their own destruction. And then I heard another voice from heaven, and this is what it said. Come out of her, my people, so that you don't become embroiled in her sins, so that you don't receive any of her plagues. This is language from Isaiah 48, Jeremiah 50, and Zechariah chapter 2. Paul said it this way, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, this particular translation says, so that you don't become embroiled in her sins. Other translations say, lest you share in her sins. And there's the Greek word, and I can't begin to pronounce it, but it's there for you. Lest you all take part in or take a sympathetic interest in her sins. So the text says, um, come out of her so that you don't become embroiled. I don't think that John is calling for his people to come out of Rome, physically particularly, but rather to have no fellowship with her works or darkness. It would have been very difficult for the Christians to have come out of Rome because the Roman Empire enveloped the entire Mediterranean world. I don't know where they would have gone to have isolated themselves from her influence. I guess there may be some times and places where we can extricate ourselves from toxic environments, um, but there's no place where the dragon cannot reach. So how do you be in the world but not of the world is the challenge, the question. 
there are, of course, a number of societies, Christian societies, that have extricated themselves from the world to a very high degree. Uh, thinking about people like the, the Amish and the Mennonites and, and the Huguenots and some others like that. And I, I think that, you know, they've, they've had a degree of success in that, but I'm not sure how that fulfills the Great Commission to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. So there's, you know, somehow or another, there has to be a balance in that, in the world but not of the world. Easy to say, difficult to achieve. I think what we see in John's audience, the Christians of the first century, is that they had a faith that was portable. It continued to sustain when systems went down. Sometimes the portability took them into the catacombs. Sometimes the portability uh, may have taken them to jail, but they carried their faith with them wherever they went. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 6, Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So the, quite, the big question and the, the conundrum and the, and the challenge becomes, how do we function in Babylon without being part of Babylon? And that, that's a real practical question and difficult to, to come up with a, a good solution. Um, we have a lot of teachers and educators in our congregation. And thank God for you. And you do yeoman duty in our public school system, administering and, and teaching and shining the light of Christ in a place that seems to me to be becoming more and more dark. We have other people who have chosen to take a different course and take on the responsibility and the obligation of training their children at home. And uh, I applaud them, and I've seen really terrific fruit from that. So... Each person has to work it out in their own way. But uh, it's a challenge. And it's not going to get easier as things go forward. Isaiah 52, depart, depart out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Come out from it. Purify yourselves. You who carry the vessels of the Lord. Think about carrying the vessels of the Lord. Wow. What a neat phrase. Jeremiah 51, flee from Babylon, escape with your lives, do not be destroyed in her punishment, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will pay her what she deserves. You know, when Jerusalem became Babylon, as it did more than once, it was the last time, AD 70, and we talked about this before, but because of the warnings of Jesus and that are recorded by Matthew in Matthew 24 and 25, uh, historians tell us that the Christians were able to flee Babylon. They were able to get out of Jerusalem before Cyrus brought the weight of the Roman Empire down and destroyed the city. Her sins are piled up to the sky, and God has remembered her wickedness. I think that there is, and we can demonstrate through history, that there is a tipping point. There's a place where God simply says, enough is enough. The last martyr has died. It's, it's time. We see this individually in, in a number of occasions uh, all through the history of uh, Hebrew and Christian scripture, especially uh, the, the Jewish scripture with, uh, in Second Chronicles, Ezra, Genesis 15, Jeremiah 51. All of those are our situation, some of them is a civil war between Israel and, and Judah. Some of it is the war with Ahaz. Some of it is uh, the situation in ancient Babylon. But in all those points, 
It came to a point where God just said, no more. And, and the text reveals that. God says, that's it. It's over. Done. Had enough. Finished. And I think that probably every human system of governing, political or whatever, reaches this point, becomes Babylon. And I, I think we can see many, many examples of this throughout history. I was just thinking about the Aztecs, Incas, and Mayas that lived in Mexico and Central America. And, uh, you know, just frequently in the news, we'll see where some archaeologist has found a whole new area where they're digging up these ancient Incan Mayan ruins and these huge civilizations. It's a huge civilization, very advanced, high culture. Best known for human sacrifice, right? That's what we remember them for. Where are they now? What happened to them? It seems to me like they just reached a tipping point. I've talked to you before about Guyana. You know, I've been down to Guyana about three times on medical missions. This is in the northeast coast of South America. <clears throat> you all know the story of Jim Jones and the where we got the phrase, don't drink the Kool-Aid. First time I went to Guyana on a medical mission, I thought, man, you know, I would really like to go take some pictures just like a tourist, right, at the Jonestown site. I figured it would be in their literature, you know, here, here's a guide, you, he'll take you out here for X number of coins. There's nothing. It's like it never happened. There are no tours. There's no roads. There's no thing. There's nothing there. The jungle has reclaimed it. The tipping point wiped it out. Of course, we saw it with Babylon. We saw it with Rome. We saw it with. Cambodia under Pol Pot. We saw it with Hitler's Nazi Germany. We're going to see it in North Korea. We're going to see it in China. And we could see it in the United States. Just a tipping point. No more. It's all I can stomach. It's over and done. I was thinking about Lot and his wife, you know, that was a tipping point too, Sodom and Gomorrah. Why they tried, they negotiated with God, said, God, can we find just 10 people that are righteous? Will you spare it? Okay, find me 10. Nope, tipping point. Fire and brimstone. Lot and his wife both got out, but Lot's wife left her heart in Sodom. And she didn't fare well. Pay her back as she has paid others. Some versions say you pay her back. That's not correct. That's not in the text. It's not ours to pay her back. Pay her back as she has paid others. Give her double again for all her deeds. Mix her a double dose in her own cup. The cup in which she mixed her poisons. It's not you. It's God. Romans 12 and 19, vengeance belongs to God. Deuteronomy 32, it is mine to avenge it. I will repay. In due time, their foot will slip. Their day of disaster is near, and their doom rushes upon them. This is Moses as he's getting ready to hand over the reins to Joshua. She made herself glorious and lived in luxury, balanced that by giving her torture and sorrow. She said in her heart, I am the queen, I am on the throne, I'm not a widow, I'll never, I'm never going to be a mourner. And in the words of Isaiah 47, listen to this, you pleasure-loving kingdom, living at ease and feeling secure, you say, I'm the only one and there's no other, I will never be a widow or lose my children. Same words. 
same results. Therefore, her plagues will come in a single day, death, mourning, and famine, and she will be burned with fire because God, the Lord, who judges her, is strong. Death for her scorn, mourning for her reveling, famine for her abundance, fire for her fornication. God is answering the cry from under the altar, how long, O Lord, holy and just, how long before you avenge the blood of your people? The kings of the earth who committed fornication with her and shared her luxury will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke from her fire. We keep coming back to the idea of fornication, 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 and for the people who were hearing this in, Ju in John's day, uh, this would have been well understood because this would have been the, the pinnacle of evidence of degradation, sexual perversion, whether it be literal or symbolic, idolatry or sexual perversion. It talks about the lament. The lament is going to come in just a few verses. It starts in verse 16 of this chapter. They, that is the kings who profited from her, will stand far off, fearful of her tortures. Alas, alas, they will say, the great city, Babylon, the powerful city, your judgment has come in a single hour. Of course, a single hour is not 60 minutes. A single hour is a short period of time. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because nobody will buy their cargo anymore. Their cargo of gold and silver, of precious stones and pearls, fine linen and pearl, uh, purple, silk and scarlet, all the sweet-smelling wood, carved ivory, vessels of expensive wood, brass, iron, marble, cinnamon, oriental spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and slaves slaves the Babylons of the world are built on slaves built with slave labor always have been the end of this very extensive list of sought after luxurious items we find slavery. How many Babylons, ancient and modern, have been built and maintained on the backs of human slaves? Pharaoh turned Israel into slaves to build the pyramids and the splendors of Egypt. Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar turned the Israelites into slaves to build Tower of Babel and the hanging gardens and all the splendor of Babylon. Rome probably had more slaves than they did citizens. Not sure about that, but they had a bunch of them. Many of the first Christians, Christians in the first century, were slaves. Made for an interesting congregation, don't you know? You come together in somebody's house and you've got a master and a slave and a freeman and a merchant and a soldier and they're all in the same body of faith. Babylonian gods demanded sacrifice, and that usually included human sacrifice, both literally and symbolically. We don't have slavery anymore, right? Well, maybe. There's a new term for it, though. It's called modern slavery. <clears throat> Definition is the severe exploitation of other people for personal 
or commercial gain. If you look at it under that definition, then it takes a little different flavor. Some forms of slavery that we have today include trafficking in people, human trafficking. These are kind of umbrella terms to refer to both sex trafficking and compelled labor today. Somebody said, and I don't know, this almost has to be pulled out of thin air, I think, but it illustrates the magnitude of it, that something like 40 million people are estimated to be trapped in modern slavery worldwide. One in four of them are children, almost three-fourths, 71%, women and girls. But what we have in Revelation is John presenting the story of the Exodus, the story of a God who sets the slaves free. All the fruit for which you longed has gone from you. All your luxuries and sparkling objects have been destroyed. You won't find them anymore. The merchants who sold these things and who made themselves rich from her will stand a long way off for fear of her tortures. They will weep and mourn and say, Alas, alas, the great city. It was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, decked out in gold, precious stones, and pearls. But in a single hour, such great wealth has been destroyed. All the master mariners, all those who ply their ships to and fro, all sailors, and all who do business on the sea, stood a long way off and shouted out when they saw the smoke of her fire. Who is like the great city, they said. They threw dust on their heads and shouted out, weeping and mourning. Alas, alas, they said, the great city. Everyone had, who had ships on the sea could get rich from her wealth. But in a single hour, she has become a desert. Celebrate over her, heaven, and you holy ones, apostles and prophets. Apostles and prophets is a way of saying the entire ecclesia of all ages. Celebrate over her because God has passed against her the sentence that she passed against you. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. And he has, and he does, and he will. In Jeremiah 51, then heaven and earth and all that is in them will shout for joy over Babylon because the destroyers from the north will come against her, declares the Lord. Then a strong or a mighty angel picked up a rock like a huge millstone and hurled it into the sea with these words, Babylon, the great city, will be thrown down just like this with a splash or with violence, as some translations say, and will never be seen again. Words from Jeremiah 51. When you get to Babylon, read aloud everything on the scroll. When you have finished reading the scroll, tie it to a stone and throw it into the Euphrates River. Then say, in this same way, Babylon and her people will sink, never to rise again. I just couldn't help but think of it. I don't know that it's relevant to this text, but I just the millstone, you know, Matthew's statement, or Christ's statement in Matthew 18. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck, be cast ground in the depths of the sea, bringing the destruction of Babylon down to a very individual, personal level. Same symbolism, same figure of speech. Never again will people hear the sound of harps, musicians, flute players, and trumpets in you. Never again will there be any skilled workmen plying their trade in you. Never again will people hear the sound of the mill in you. Words from Isaiah 24. The joyful tambourines have ceased. The noise of the revelers has stopped. The joyful harp, the harp is silent. How do you think this sounded to John's audience? These people who were being persecuted, who were being driven underground, who were being killed by Rome. 
Do you think this would give you strength to persevere? Strength to carry on one more day? God's not ignorant of this. God sees it all. God will not always be quiet, not always be silent. Babylon's days are numbered. Never again will anyone see the light of a lamp in you. Never again will anyone hear the voice of, by, of, of a bridegroom and bride in you. Your merchants were the mighty ones of the earth. All the natives, all the nations were deceived by your magic or by your sorcery. In her has been found the blood of prophets and God's holy ones and all those who have been slaughtered on the earth. Who are they now? They're under the altar crying, how long, O God? And what's John say? God hears you. He is not unconcerned. Magic and sorcery. Nations were deceived by your magic or by your sorcery. Jeremiah 25, moreover, I will banish from them the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of the bride and the bridegroom, the sound of the millstone and the light of the, of the lamp. Ezekiel 26, I will silence the sound of your songs and the music of your lyres will no longer be heard. It's going to get quiet. It's going to get deathly quiet. Let's go back to the, silent, to the, to the uh, magic minute, the, the sorcerers. The word uh, pharmakia, Sounds like an English word, doesn't it? Pharmacy. The word pharmacy comes from this Greek term. Uh, we don't like to think <laughs> that our pharmacies are dealing in, in magic. <laughs> We'd like for them to be a little bit more scientific than that. <laughs> the use of drugs of any kind for magical effects. And you can see how the, how the relation came about. That w w the English term would, would be picked up and derived from that, given that definition. Isaiah lists her sorceries, which include uh, enchantments, astrology, stargazing, monthly prognostication, um, pretty specific list. Uh, do you ever en engage in sorcery, any of you? Are you ever been engaged in magical pursuits. How many of you read your horoscope? Only for fun. <laughs> Only for fun. I quit. I'll just tell you the truth. I used to for fun. But I got worried about it. How many of you ever played with a Ouija board? <laughs> I quit that too, and I never did much of it. I, it, it. God takes it pretty seriously. Those who practice sorcery have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. We're going to come to in Revelation 21. And then Revelation 22, at the very end of this, it says they will never enter the new Jerusalem. Pretty good reason uh, not to take any chances with it. Better just to, just to avoid it. But that's me. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. That's the story of the 18th chapter of Revelation. Vengeance is mine. I think, I think we, I think we just have time to listen to the 19th chapter. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe we better not. Maybe we better wait and, and save that for uh, for next uh, Sunday. Uh, I've got a great song for you next Sunday. You're gonna love it. Well, I've been talking a lot. We got a mic here, and we got two or three minutes. Uh, any comments? <laughs> Belinda's shaking her head. I've never seen that before. 
<laughs> I know. <laughs> Anybody else want to add anything or, or take issue with anything I said? Hmm? Do what? On the way home. You want to do it on the way home? <laughs> will it reach? You think the, the, the mic will reach that far? Dan, you want the last two minutes? Have you been sitting there chewing on something that's been been bugging you? Why don't you why don't you discuss that? <laughs> More of a joke than discussion. <laughs> His, his comment was that he, he was wondering if the pharmacists were going to make it to heaven or not. <laughs> well, our time, we're within about a minute or two of our time, so I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap it up. If I, if I don't have any other questions or comments or challenges or disagreements or other unpleasant things, we are going to be going in next week into the, uh, the preparing and the participating in the marriage supper of the Lamb. So things are looking better. Things are looking better. We still have to get to Armageddon. We'll get past that. And then we'll be ready to take another look at the throne room, check out the dimensions of God's home, and wait for the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Good things are coming. It's taken us a while to get there. Well, thank you for being here and for your participation and attention, and uh, thank you to all of you who are with us online and uh, if you have questions or comments, feel free to email me, call, text, whatever. Uh, with that, have a wonderful God-blessed week.